Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 11 starts now. Start your engines. The Grand Prix set to make its pitch to stay on Belle Isle. She was quitting her job. What set her off during her exit interview that caused this Metro Detroit woman to allegedly assault her HR manager? A small house explosion in a Macomb County neighborhood. What investigators found in the basement that may have caused the blast. All coming up, but we're going to begin tonight at 11 with the search for a gunman after two men are shot in Inkster. Both men were sitting in a car when someone approached them, started talking, and then opened fire. It happened at the corner of Harrison and Somerset. Our Jermont Terry is live at the Inkster Police Department with what we know about the victims. Jermont, good evening. Good evening, Kimberly. Tonight, that driver passed away after witnesses tell me someone shot him in the face. As for his passenger in the minivan with him, he was shot but alert when emergency crews took him from the scene. And tonight, investigators are hoping that individual can shed light, leaving one neighborhood completely worried. These are the sounds of summer those living off Somerset and Harrison and Inkster expect to hear. And I've been here for about six, seven years, and we never had any problems here. As Isaac Dixon stood outside his house, something caught his attention by the stop sign out front. Only thing I seen was their car run that stop sign, and he had no intentions on stopping. State police say that car Isaac spotted was involved in a double shooting that left one man dead and a second person seriously injured down the block. The best description we got was an orangish, reddish, new model Challenger. Officers were on scene bagging evidence. The investigation reveals someone from that Challenger fired several shots at close range. So the driver of the Challenger actually got out of the vehicle, walked over to the driver's side of the van. Uh, there was a discussion held between the two of them for a bit. Um, then he pulled a weapon out. Witnesses tell me the driver who died was shot in his face. The passenger collapsed on the sidewalk where neighbors helped out. Police say the gunman jumped back into the Challenger with someone else in the car, speeding right past Isaac. I got foster kids here, and I'm worried about them playing out here in the street now. I really am. And so I hope you guys find out who done it. While neighbors are rightfully concerned, police want one thing to be known. But it appears that uh, this wasn't a random incident. And while state police are stressing that this is not a random incident, they are not going as far to say what they believe the victims and the gunmen were doing at that location this afternoon. Of course, if you know anything, give them a call. For now, reporting live in Inkster, Jermont Terry, Local 4. A small explosion inside a Sterling Heights home has a man in critical condition. Police say the explosion happened around 4.30 this morning in the basement of a home on Johnson Drive. That's near Ryan and 14 Mile. Police say the 40-year-old man had third-degree burns all over his body when they arrived. Now, they also found a small marijuana grow operation in the basement, though it is still unclear if that was a factor in causing the blast. A Redford woman is arrested after police say she stabbed a co-worker. Sakira Ellis was turning in her equipment after quitting her job from Custom Home Health Center on Big Beaver in Troy. Well, the victim told police Ellis became upset when she was told she had to pay $500 to fix a broken tablet. It's alleged that Ellis then put the victim in a chokehold and stabbed her with a pen. She left before police got there but was arrested a short time later. She's now charged with assault and battery. And today we got a look at the men accused of physically assaulting three patients at a mental health facility. The alleged abuse took place at Livonia Cope facility. Seven employees were involved in the case. Five of them are accused of assaulting patients, even strangling them. A doctor and nurse are accused of not reporting the abuse to the proper authorities. All of the accused claim their actions were in self-defense. Will Detroit be the destination for IndyCar racing next year? The contract for the Grand Prix is up, but the pitch for a new deal goes in front of the Belle Isle Advisory Committee tomorrow morning. Race organizers say the island is really the only venue that makes any sense. That's according to race chairman Bud Dinker, who spoke with our Mara McDonald tonight, who's got more now on what we know about the pitch coming tomorrow. Mara. Hi, Devin. That pitch, we are told, is going to be for a multi-year contract, and it will include a fee increase for the state for the use of this island. In other words, the Grand Prix says they want its home to be Belle Isle. 
Racing in Detroit was a thing of the past until Roger Penske brought the thrill of Indy cars to Belle Isle, and that was well before all the makeover to the park started happening. It's the Grand Prix and its sponsors that have pumped millions, a little more than 13 million to be precise, into improvements here, including turning the water on in the landmark Scott Fountain again. You're going to see us propose our, a fee increase to the state to use the uh, the uh, Belle Isle Park for the time we have it. And you're also going to see a condensed number of days also by which we're going to be here in terms of load in and load out. Those are all going to be terms that we provide tomorrow. The race brings in an estimated $50 million for the metro region when the drivers and their fans roll into town. And while nobody is complaining about the money generated, there have been complaints about the setup time and the limited access to the park in the spring. Others see it as just a part of an international event. It doesn't bother me. I came when they were setting up and everything, and we enjoyed it, you know. And it's for a good cause. It's, it's bringing revenues to the city, so hey. Organizers take those criticisms seriously. We know it's intrusive to some people. We know it's an inconvenience to some people as well. We're listening to them, we're working with them, we're partnering with them, and making changes to listening to them as well. Back here live, that pitch goes in front of that Belle Isle Advisory Council tomorrow morning. That council is made up of mayoral and gubernatorial uh, appointees. After that's done, then the official paperwork goes over to the DNR. Devin, Kimberly, back to you. And Mar, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the story, they, uh, they really only see this as the only alternative, right? There's no viable option somewhere else at the moment. They don't see any other viable option. They say they have looked at city airport. They've looked at the fairgrounds, neither of which fit the bill. Well, what about uh, racing again downtown Detroit yeah. like they did when I was a kid? They say it's just not feasible. This really is the only option. Back to All you. right, they'll make their case bright and early tomorrow. All right, Mara. Kim. It's been a mystery for 21 years, but tonight we know what happened to Mark and Janice Davies of Howell. Back in 1997, the couple's single engine plane disappeared up north. Well, this week, a Forest Service surveyor found the plane's wreckage in a heavily wooded and swampy area of the Hiawatha National Forest near St. Ignace. Friends of the couple say the two were planning their future up north and were supposed to return to Howell when their plane went missing. They flew up there to look at their property and probably get some idea what type of building they wanted to. And it was, I believe, on a Friday, and they're supposed to come home on a Sunday. Nothing. The plane was supposed to land at the Livingston County Airport, but investigators say instead of going south, it went west and disappeared from Canadian radar, flying due west, which is where they found the plane. New video shows the moments after a Lamborghini crashes into a tree in Bloomfield Hills. Police say the driver lost control on Woodward near Long Lake Road last Saturday. Driver and passenger somehow only suffered minor injuries. Uh, this video comes to us from WJR's Paul W. Smith and his wife Kim. They were right there when it happened. This shows the moments right after the crash. Paul W. told me he believes the car was going well over 100 miles an hour down Woodward when it crashed. Alcohol, we should point out, is suspected as being a factor. Two Detroit men are accused of hacking into a gas pump and stealing hundreds of gallons of gasoline on the city's west side. 29-year-old Damon Blocker and 34-year-old Reginald Hollian are charged with using a computer to commit a crime and larceny. Police say the men gained control of a pump at the Marathon gas station on Seven Mile Road near the Southfield Freeway and stole about $1,800 worth of fuel last month. The two were arrested on Monday. They'll both be back in court next week. A homeowner goes too far trying to get revenge with a contractor. What he did with a portable toilet that landed him in jail. Coming up. A family kept noticing their homegrown tomatoes were disappearing. They suspected a squirrel, but they never expected who it would turn out to be. Ben. Those tomatoes need some water. We're going to see if we can get them that. But the humidity starts sneaking in. Comfortable early, starting to feel more summer-like by lunch. We'll look at the rest of your weekend coming up teaching your children how to protect themselves when you're not with them. No, no, no! I use the soccer kick, the peppering, and the hammer fist. I like elbowing him. Learning how they would react when facing danger. It's one thing to practice dialing 911 when you're sitting on the sofa looking at the numbers and you feel safe, but when you're scared and your heart rate has elevated. I'm local Fort Defender Karen Drew, the program that puts your children's safety skills to the test.